Good afternoon. Today is Monday, May the 10th. It is 5 p.m. We're here for the regular trustee meeting, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have an agenda before us. Are there any additions or modifications? If not, do we have a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Crux? Yes. I make a motion to accept the general ledger report in the amount of $395,190.85 for the 5-5-21 payroll. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Trustee Cross? Yes. I make a motion to accept the payment listings report in the amount of $462,692.85 for warrants through five, May 6, 2021. Second. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. <clears throat> At this time, uh, we have minutes before us for the April 26, 2021 regular trustee meeting. Is there any change, changes or recommendations? If not, we have a motion to accept them as Thank presented. I make a motion to accept the minutes for the April 26 regular trustee meeting. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Trustee Press? Yes. All right. And at this time, we open up the podium to any citizens desiring to speak. You have uh, three minutes if you can just give us your name and address, and we'll be happy to listen to you. Uh, Chet Bryant, 1234 Homestead Drive. Uh, with Fire Station 66 being a related topic to the Valley Bell Connector Road, I wanted to touch on it briefly. I know you don't agree with my points about the road, but I hope you keep an open mind tonight. As far as I can tell, the genesis of the two new fire stations is sta the Standards of Cover Report, which was started seven years ago and published five years ago. Because so many things have changed in that time, I have two topics that I think fit squarely in your fiduciary responsibilities and the results of which should be communicated clearly to the public. A lot has changed in the years since two additional fire stations were recommended by the 16 report, uh, which used various assumptions and models. Even the census data used is now outdated. It would make sense that a thorough re-examination be conducted to determine if the second of the two fire stations still needs to be constructed. Just some of the reasons include the construction of Station 65 has already rectified the only service area square mileage anomaly, 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 you know what I mean, that existed in the standards of cover report. It is likely that the nine policy recommendations from the report have been implemented and made responses more efficient. Building the fire stations was the most expensive of four specific recommendations to alleviate underserved distribution. It's likely the first three recommendations are in place and have made responses more efficient. Have or can mutual aid agreements with Xenia Station 32 expand to cover more of the southeast corner? Since it's actually closer than Station 64, Station 61 might be able to adequately service the southeast area of the township if its service area is extended south and west as recommended in map 36 of the report. Factors that support this include, since the coverage area for the new Station 65 receives significantly fewer calls than other stations, its coverage boundary could move slightly south, allowing six and Station 61 to, to focus its cover on the southeast corner. The super intersection at Factory will be completed soon, and the upgrade at Trabine and Highway 35 has been funded. Both of these allow for faster response times from Station 61 to the southeast corner. Actual data using the new Station 65 and road upgrades could be collected over the coming year to replace many of the assumptions and models used so many years ago. I have seen you save taxpayers thousands in countertop and metal plating decisions in Station 65, here's a chance to just investigate if you could save them millions of dollars. Finally, if the station does need to be built, 
The second topic should, should be reexamined is if the proposed siting of 66 is optimal for emergency response. From my records request, it appears no standalone study was ever accomplished, and there's been a very myopic focus on ALS response to the far southeast corner. However, proper siting requires a blend of many factors, and focusing on one is often detrimental to the others. For instance, aggregating the 2020 response data from this meeting's biweekly report shows that 92% of EMS responses are west of Valley Road, most of them far to the west, in Station 66's likely service area. Locating the station so far east will shorten uh, some of the very infrequent response times to the southeast area, but increase response times to the vast majority of other life-saving responses. In the 2016 report, the current fire stations, none of them come close to meeting the 90th percentile goals for fire or medical turnout. Looking at all responses in Station 66's likely service area, 90% of them will be west, and most are significantly west of the proposed site. Choosing this location will ensure the new station will not even come close to meeting those turnout goals. As indicated in maps 27, 29, and 30, the long-term medical fire and service hotspots are far west of Valley Road as well. While I understand the need to respond to all corners of the township, it seems the pursuit of that goal is coming at the expense of metrics that will be critical in responding to the 90th percentile of overall goals. In addition, short, long, and mid-term development patterns will result in more calls far west of Valley Road, the placement of the second high school, Russ researchers push to develop their campus, and even future residential units are likely to be west of Valley Road for the most part. Before construction would begin, it seems prudent to ensure the location of the station is in the optimal location for current as well as projected responses. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time this evening Thank you. and the last three meetings. Any other citizens desiring to speak this time? Come on up. Okay, we'll close that portion. <clears throat> um, for those that are in the audience, um, we appreciate all comments that come before us. We are not, um, many times what we do is, especially when we have pre-scheduled speakers, we do not necessarily respond to all comments that come before us at that, at, at that moment. Um, sometimes we defer them to later in the meeting. Um, but we, we try to address those comments if we can and if it makes sense. Um, if it's the same request that comes back to us multiple times, then we do not um, uh, continue to engage on that necessarily. So um, with that, we have a pre-scheduled speaker, um, Desmond Sproul of Wright State University, Master of Public Administration, MPA student. So come on up. I just wanted to introduce Desmond. Uh, Desmond's been working with us as an MPA, a Master's of Public Administration student from Wright State. We have some illustrious uh, graduates of that program in the room today. Um, he worked on a plan to help us plan for our comprehensive land use update. It's a big project. It's probably about a year long project. So having a good plan and good recommendations for how to go about that was really important to us. Desmond did some great work. I want to let him tell you about what he found out. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Desmond. Hello, everyone. Here we go. First slide. First slide. Okay, so a brief overview of my project. Um, the first part of my project was a focus on reviewing existing literature and best practices on comprehensive planning and citizen engagement comprehensive planning. Um, for this review, I focused on a variety of sources, including consulting professional associations like the American Planning Association, academic publications and journals like the Journal of Environmental, um, <coughs> Environmental Planning and Management, planning websites, and government-related sources like Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission and Green County um, Regional Planning and Coordinating Commission. Um, in addition to this, I did a review of local township comprehensive plans that have been completed since 2000. And for this review, I focused on Greene County and the counties that border it. However, of these counties, the only counties that had comprehensive plans available online for townships were townships in Greene County, Montgomery County, and Warren County for a total of 10 townships in the review. These uh, two reviews were used to make recommendations for updating the comprehensive plan process. Okay, so what is comprehensive planning? 
The American Planning Association, Association defines comprehensive plan as the adopted official statement of a legislative body of local government that sets forth goals, policies, and guidelines intended to direct the present and future physical, social, and economic development that occurs within its planning jurisdiction. In Ohio, the comprehensive plan also assorts supports authority for and guides township zoning with the Ohio Revised Code stating that townships can regulate building size, location, and use in accordance with the comprehensive plan. While this um, statute doesn't require it to be the township's comprehensive plan, it could be a county plan. It's a lot more personalized to the township. It's a lot more useful if it's a township comprehensive plan. Comprehensive planning is a proactive approach to the future rather than a reactive. So during the planning process, you're trying to identify trends to address issues before they become an issue. So if there's a changing economy, you want to plan for that changing economy or ch changing demographics before it's an issue later on. Comprehensive planning supports coordinating decision making because you're trying to look at different aspects of community in a unified way. So instead of just looking at the economy or just looking at transportation, you're looking at the role between transportation and the economy, like how could you improve your transportation to support economic development. Comprehensive planning can also offer potential savings to the community through more efficient planning. So you might be able to avoid service overlap if you plan out all the different aspects of the community all one time together. Okay, so citizen engagement comprehensive planning. While initial comprehensive, comprehensive planning efforts in the United States in the early 1900s were top down by experts, um, this has shifted over the past several decades towards incorporating substantial citizen engagement in the comprehensive planning process. A common theme through all the literature I reviewed from a variety of sources was that citizen engagement serves as a foundation for success in comprehensive planning. You need to keep citizens involved in the process, it's gonna be reflective of their needs. Some of the benefits of citizen engagement comprehensive planning, including allowing citizens to play a role in shaping your future community. So while experts have a good idea of the ideal process for these things and what all needs to be addressed, they can't, it doesn't matter how much education or experience they have, they can't figure out what the citizens actually want. The citizens have to tell them and help shape the process. <clears throat> citizen engagement also helps increase um, the citizens' understanding of trade-offs required in planning. So while citizens might have a certain need or certain desire, they might not understand why or might not see why government has to make certain, de certain decisions that look like they overlook that need, but they're balancing against all the other community needs and they have to operate in a situation where they have limited resources. If citizens are engaged throughout the process and they're seeing those trade-offs play off during the planning process, maybe we're more willing to accept them over the long term. Citizen engagement informs planners of the community's needs, uh, concerns, and desires for the future. So they're not trying to guess them or predict them. They can actually just hear from the citizens. Here's what we want. Here's our priorities for doing it. And this is how we'd like you to do it. It can help build a sense of community um, and consensus throughout the citizens. So you're going to see they, at any given citizen engagement event, there's going to be people with conflicting ideas. But under those ideas, a lot of times there's similar goals. Like you want a safer community, a more prosperous community. You just have different ideas how to get there. If you work towards consensus gradually and you're working together, you can help foster a sense of community throughout the community. It also increases community buy into planning because if citizens play a role in the process, they're more likely to accept the final results because they feel like they actually did something instead of just being told what was going to happen to their community. You next. Okay. Um, back one. Oh. Okay. Um, here's some of the methods of citizen engagement conference planning. While there are many different methods, this um, review focused on methods that were viable for smaller communities with limited resources. Um, the first is public meetings. It's one of the most common forms of citizen engagement and has many subforms. The four most common subtypes I found during my review was open houses, public hearings, advisory meetings, and workshops. Open houses are just like they sound like. They're the same thing as they were for open houses for like um, kids' schools where there's a big open room, a lot of times there's information stations around and facilitators available to ask, answer questions. They're usually held for several hours at a time so they can accommodate a variety of schedules and needs, but they require a bigger room and more people available to help out. Public hearings are a lot more formal process where a lot of times they're required by law for adopting legislation or considering it, and there's usually a comment period where citizens, reg citizens can register their comments. Advisory meetings might start similar to public hearings and they present information, but after the information is presented, there's a lot more um, of an open floor for discussion with the citizens on their ideas, their thoughts on the process, how they'd like to see it approached. It's a lot more like a group brainstorming activity. Finally, workshops are the most engaging of the performed public meetings, where it's usually a lot smaller group of around eight to 12 people. And there can be hands-on activities like mapping exercises where you might <coughs> use a post-it note to pinpoint where you'd like to see future development, what type of it. 
Um, the second type is stakeholder interviews and focus groups. These are grouped together. While they're not the exact same thing, they both allow for target outreach, but they both have high time requirements and require skill facilitation. So you need time to not only select participants, but you need to prepare for the materials you're going to use during the interview or focus group, hold that, and then analyze the open-ended findings from that to incorporate into the planning process. Whereas the public meetings, you can just schedule it, and whoever comes, comes. Um, they're useful for when you know you need to reach a certain demographic or you need certain information, but other methods should be considered first because of the higher time requirements. Surveys are useful to reach a larger audience that may not participate in other methods. So in a lot of citizen engagement events, you have the same really active few citizens that have come to all the events. Surveys help you reach people who don't have the time or don't have the will to go to a public event because you can mail it to their house or send to their email and they can respond without much effort on their part. So you can reach a lot wider audience. What a lot of townships did who used surveys, um, they basically gauge initial ideas at the meetings or interviews and focus groups and then use the surveys to assess a wider public preference for how they'd like to see that, the priority of those. So public meeting might come up, they might brainstorm some initial ideas and then those ideas are ranked by the citizens in a, a preference survey. Online engagement, while it can fit into many different types, like they're gonna be online meetings or online surveys, it's grouped on its own because it's the newest, me newest method of citizen engagement and planning, but it's a growing in importance due to the rise of internet usage, the rise of social media. Um, online engagement, like I said, you can have an online meeting through a platform like Zoom or WebEx, or you can set an online survey. You can have online websites that um, the county, Green County actually right now, they're updating their um, regional plan, the county plan, and with Miami, Re Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, they have a website where citizens can go and check out the progress on it. Online engagement, while it's useful for reaching a wider audience and more specifically a younger audience that you would with most other methods of public engagement, it should not be used by it on its own because it has the potential to miss key minority groups including African Americans, Latinos, lower, in lower income households, and the elderly. They're all less likely to use online engagement with other demographics. So you need to use it in pair with another one of these methods, not on its own. Okay, so here's a table that shows what type of citizen engagement were found in the 10 townships that reviewed. Quick glance can show you that public meetings were overwhelmingly the most common. The only ones that didn't do it, Clear Creek and Sugar Creek. Uh, Sugar Creek. Clear Creek had no engagement throughout there as mentioned. Sugar Creek was doing a strategic update where they used previous goals from um, the last comprehensive plan planning effort, and it was just the planning officials doing an update based on those goals. So they were relying on previous public input Everybody else used public meetings. Stakeholder interviews and focus groups, they were the least common, but that's uh, partly explained by the higher requirements. Neither one of those, um, Union or Deerfield didn't explain what they talked about in those. I should actually probably cover, most of the townships here, they only briefly mentioned they did these activities. They didn't describe how they did them with the exception of Jefferson Township and Union Township. And Jefferson Township, was largely led by Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. So they had a larger influence than the township actually did. But most of them, they mentioned they held public meetings or that it was available. They did not miss, mention the number of participants or how much depth they went into or what topics they covered. So that was a lacking part where it's recommended to do all those things and the research, like explain what you did in a plan, plan so people who read the plan can tell, but it was not found in these plans. Surveys and online engagement almost match each other because most townships, their online engagement was a survey. A couple of them also had a website where they um, showed progress updates, but most of them used online for sending out their surveys. Okay, so the steps in the comprehensive planning process. While every community is a little bit different for this process, um, they're commonly following the same steps or same general procedures. The first step is formation of advisory committee. An advisory committee is a group of stakeholders that meets throughout the planning process deliberate on and guide the process, ideally representing the diversity of the community. Here you want to try and reach as many different groups as possible in the community so you have a representation of the community so they can speak to the needs of all different groups in the community throughout the whole process. While the ultimate authority to adopt the final plan is going to depend on the government elected officials, the advisory committee can guide the process and show their symbolic adoption near the end. and tell the planning officials how it would be best to reach their constituencies. So if you have a certain minority group that doesn't, mostly doesn't speak English, 
if you have a representative from them, they might be able to tell you what the best way to reach them would be so you can get their input throughout the planning process. The second step is data collection and analysis of existing conditions. Here you want to collect data from a wide range of sources to create a profile of the community, looking at trends and projections for areas like the population, existing land use, housing, transportation, the natural environment, community utilities and services, the local economy, and employment. While specific areas are going to vary by the community, like how much you need to em emphasize a certain area, these are some common areas that are addressed in almost all of the plans. Uh, Devin Shoemaker from the Regional Planning Coordinating Commission in Greene County emphasized getting down to the details on this so you can improve the accuracy of future projections. After the data collection and analysis of existing conditions, you have identifying issues, opportunities, goals, and a future vision. This is where community vision through citizen engagement activities comes in, where you have visioning workshops or surveys on future vision preferences or any numbers of engagement activities. This is the largest area for engagement throughout the process. You want to bring as many different groups together as possible to get an idea of what they want the future to look like and come up with some ideas how to get to that vision. So you need to identify key values that the community holds, what they want the future vision to be, what steps can get them there. Okay, so fourth, you address the content elements. These are the chapters that address specific topics in detail, covering the state of the topic, like the state of the local economy, as well as trends and projections for the future. So this is where you take those, um, the existing conditions, and break them down to the depth. So you have a chapter just on the economy that might be a few pages just talking about all the different metrics for the economy. The common content elements are largely the same as the existing condition elements. How much depth you go in a specific area is going to depend on what you identify during the um, visioning and the existing conditions analysis. So if citizens emphasize the economy is a huge area that needs work, you're probably going to spend more time on that in the content elements where you devote more work talking about it. Once you've addressed these, you start creating an implementation plan. This is another big area for citizen engagement where you want to get the people involved on how do they think you can best address these, these aspects. Because if they, have, if they play a role in shaping implementation, they're going to have more commitment towards seeing it through. Whether that means they're actually involved or they're making sure their government's staying on top of it. If they play a role in shaping implementation ideas, they're more likely to follow through with that. Finally, you have where you draft the plan, you present the plan to the public, and offer them the opportunity to provide feedback on it. If necessary, make any changes to that, and then you adopt it. First, you want to have the advisory committee symbolically adopt it, show their support for it, but then ultimately the government has to adopt it, the elected officials. You begin an implement implementation, and then every so often you review the plan. You want to do an annual review where you briefly cover everything and assess how implementation is going, possibly offering an implementation report um, on that yearly review so you can show citizens what you've accomplished the past year and keep it on everybody's mind. And then you want a full plan review every three to five years. The full plan review varies a bit by communities. Um, communities that aren't changing a whole lot, they might extend it out to 10, sometimes even 20 years. But for a smaller, uh, growing community, you want to do it more frequently. Okay, so this is a key content area for Beaver Creek Township, floodplains, repairing corridors, and wetlands. This would fall under an environment sen environmentally sensitive area, the specific one for this township, because there's 536.3 acres of inventory wetlands. While most communities have floodplain regulations in place to meet minimum requirements for participating in the National Flood Insurance Program, the minimum requirements do not require waterway setbacks. They're meant to limit insurance claims, not protect the environment. Beaver Creek Township goes above the minimum in establishing a 50-foot setback on around waterways in Article 15 of its zoning resolution. While noteworthy, this is likely too small a setback for protecting the natural environment. According to the American Planning Association, a 100-foot setback is commonly accepted as the minimum for filtering out pollutants into the waterways, and 300 foot's um, the minimum for protecting the wildlife habitats. So if you want to address these areas, the setback likely needs to be expanded. Low impact development is another way, in addition to waterway setbacks, to protect the environment and address flooding concerns using site, de site design techniques to minimize the impact of the environment and water management. However, this was not addressed in depth in the report because during Beaver Creek Township's last comprehensive plan in 2013, it was addressed thoroughly. So all there really is to say is keep doing the same thing. Keep pr talking about it in depth. Keep making the same recommendations because we covered very well in the previous plan. 
When floodplain and wetland management are identified as key concerns, you can also consider a dedicated floodplain, wetland, and stormwater management plan. As these are all very technical topics, I was looking at some simple things you can incorporate into the planning process, but these are all, there's a lot of expertise that goes in, go into these. So if like during the visioning process, it, it's identified that citizens really care about the floodplains and wetlands and potential risk from these or protecting the environment, it'd be worthwhile looking into a separate plan that you could integrate into comprehensive, comprehensive plan on these issues. Okay, so this research led to four main recommendations. The first, at all points, maximize authentic citizen engagement. While citizen engagement is going to look different at different points, you want to try and maximize any opportunity you have for it include citizens. So Martin Kim, when I was talking to him from Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, he said during the initial stages for the analysis of existing, analysis of existing conditions, it's likely just sharing information. There's not a whole lot of citizens can do in that. That's something the government officials have to do. But you can keep them involved by sharing information, telling them what you're doing. The biggest area is during the visioning process where they're basically guiding that whole, that whole step. You're facilitating them, but you want to give them the opportunity to give their input and talk what they want to happen and create their future vision that you can all work together later to implement. Implementation is another good step for citizen engagement as that there's likely to be increased buy-in if, if citizens play a role in developing implementation strategies. But any opportunity, if anybody in the process comes up with more ideas for uh, citizen engagement, you want to maximize it. The second recommendation, at all points, consider opportunities for collaboration and coordination with other jurisdictions and agencies. So while the comprehensive plan focuses on the future of a particular community, that community exists in the context of a lot of other communities. The best example for this that I can think of is related to water management. One community can do all they want to protect the environment, but if someone right over across the outside of your community isn't protecting their environment, that water is going to flow right back into your community and it's going to be tainted by the community that's not doing their part. So by collaborating with other communities, you can make sure you can make all your efforts more effective and possibly get support for initiatives that other communities are also trying to address. Third, follow the steps identified here for the conference and planning process. Form a diverse representative advisor committee that can help guide the process and tell the planning officials how to reach out to their constituencies. Do a thorough data collection analysis of existing conditions where you want to collect as much data as possible on a wide range of areas so you can make more accurate future projections. Identify issues, opportunities, goals, future vision through community visioning. This is where you want to maximize citizen engagement and let them guide this step. The content elements. The commonly addressed content elements covered earlier are good places to start here, but what you identify in the previous steps will tell you how much depth you need to go on in each of these areas. Create an implementation plan. This is where you're putting all these ideas into action with the help of the citizens, how you're going to achieve things. Finally, drafting, adopting, implementing, and reviewing the plan. Create a draft, show it to the public, offer them the opportunity to provide feedback, formally adopt it, begin implementing it and review it annually briefly and then more in depth every three to five years. My final recommendation is implement buffer zones around waterways. So expand that to if you want to filter out pollutants 100 foot, protect the natural environments around the waterways 300 foot. And continue encouraging low impact development to protect waterway wetlands and repairing corridors like was done in the last plan. I'd like to acknowledge the Beaver Creek Township officials that worked with me throughout this plan. Um, Alex, Randy, and Max, they met with me throughout the plan and gave me information on the township and were there for me if I need anything. I'd like to thank planning experts from my Regional Planning Commission. Mark Kim met with me. Devin Shoemaker and Deandre Navertil also met with me, giving me their ideas on what I was researching, where to look for more information, and suggestions for this township's process. Finally, my capstone advisor, Dr. Mary Winning, a associate professor at Wright State University, she worked with me out throughout this entire project and guided me and made us what it is. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions? Questions? Very comprehensive presentation. No <laughs> pun intended. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, very nice job. Yeah. The, uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, where you pointed out the 50 foot uh, setback from the wetlands. So I um, appreciate you bringing that. Uh, to our attention, the uh, in my other life, uh, from a commercial real estate standpoint, I run across um, numerous cities that surround us. Um, in fact, that have no requirement 
Um, and so it, it's actually surprising when they when you find that out that it's it, they rely 100% on the EPA to make that determination. So um, your um, your recommendation is uh, should be uh, considered as far as considering expanding that from 50 to 100. Um, 300 it gets it, it gets. That, that create that can create other complexities yeah that we have to deal with and it yeah you have to balance it against economic concerns and other issues in the community right. and, it, and, it, and you can't have a case by case situation you have to make you have to you know, come up with a plan and stick with it so but appreciate you bringing that to attention and um, that was my personal insight into it but appreciate the effort you put in and, and otherwise it was a, a very good presentation very thorough Any thank you you know thank you very much thank for you. presenting appreciate it Thank you. Um, and I would just recommend that when you're presenting, engage or look at us a little bit more. I know you're probably nervous. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you did a good job. Just Thank maybe you. slow it down a little bit and take a couple of breaths in between. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you so much. You appear to be passionate about what you're doing, so that's that's a good thing. Thank Might you. be sitting in this seat someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am my MPA, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It, Desmond. Thank you. All right. So we had no um, <clears throat> no old business. For those that are in the audience, I. I just make a few comments with regards to the, um, the comments that were made during the uh, public comment section. And so, and this is really just more informational than anything. So the, um, there was reference made to a road being constructed near uh, the Wood Ridge development and that road um, is, is uh, termed as the Valley Bell Connector. Um, that, that may not be the ultimate name of that road, uh, but that is a county road. It is not a township road um, to make that clear. So. Um, it's part of the county's uh, thoroughfare plan. It's been on that thoroughfare plan for, I don't know how long. Since 1991. Yeah, so a um, long, long time. And so it's, when the county's looking at um, adding a road like that, there are considerations, obviously, that come from the township that the road is within, but also when it's on the thoroughfare plan, it's because they're looking at from a county-wide thoroughfare um, and what the needs are. Um, and Green County obviously ex extends beyond Beaver Creek Township. So uh, when folks are trying to get from Sugar Creek Township to the base, um, they look for the paths of least resistance to be able to do that, as well as future congestion points, um, where other housing developments have been planned, where they're under construction, and where they've been approved. But you may just look at it and think that it's an average uh, corn and bean field at this point. Um, so there's a lot of activity out there. With regards to the standard of cover, <clears throat> our chief put that together for this board, um, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't have the reference points as far as the timing, but I'm sure they're very close to accurate. Um, but the standards of cover, what it really does is it's intended to look at our physical assets, our human assets, and um, our apparatus, um, where all of those pieces, uh, people and parts are, are situated. And then it looks at our call volume history. And so it has to look backwards in order to be able to look forward. Um, you, have, you have to know what you've done, where you've been, and what the trends and what the patterns are. So we put all of that to play in place. Um, we ran models and modeling essentially of what our historic response times were to the various corners of the township. And um, then beyond that, then we have to project forward based on traffic volumes, um, congestion, where developments, everything is going into place where all of our residents will be, where our businesses will and or could be. And so we develop models for that. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we develop the standards of cover um, that the chief has, had presented. And in 2019, uh, we put that to a vote. And 6,002 people voted yes for that levy. And 4,226 people voted no for that levy. And so it behooves all of us then to look at what those voters approved. And it was approved based on, we were, we were very transparent with regard to that standard of cover report. And we put that out in the community. Um, we, we shared that with the community. We put it out in uh, the In Touch magazine as far as the, the summary of results. And um, we actually went through many of the steps that um, uh, Desmond just went through as far as the planning and the the transparency that, uh, of, of those 
uh, standard of cover results, what we came back with. And that's, that's what's led us to Station 65 and Station 66. Um, we actually went through and we had to, um, uh, we worked with uh, uh, the county commissioners, Ms. Wallace will remember this, uh, where we had uh, two of the three commissioners um, that were uh, fully on board with uh, Station 66, which is the one that goes near the fire station, near the airport. And we had one commissioner that was not. And so what I'll ask is everybody in the room to do the same test that we asked that commissioner, because he lived, he was the last house in Beaver Creek Township, right before Sugar Creek Township um, is where he lived. He lived over on Sugar Bush Trail or Sugar Brook Trail. And so he said, you have Station 64. He said, that's right there. He says, how do you need to, you know, from a response time to get up to Country Club of the North or to Wood Ridge or to Bexley Hills? Um, into those areas, you know, why do we need a station there? And we explained to them that based on the standard of cover, our apparatus, the, the majority of calls that we were getting were to the green or to 675. So I'd ask everybody in this room, um, if you can just for, take three deep breaths if you can, just consciously take three deep breaths. And then I'll ask you to hold your breath for three minutes with me. And if, if you can hold it for three minutes, raise your hand at the end of the three minutes for me. Anybody still holding? Okay, that's why we need a fire station at uh, the location there at Station 66. Okay. All right, so we'll go on from there. Any old business? We had none. Any new business? We had none. And Green County Sheriff's Report. Uh, thank you, Board. On page 11 is the biweekly re report for the Sheriff's Office. Sergeant Morris here from the substation to answer any questions. I'm glad that you made it. I saw you on the traffic, <laughs> directing so traffic. Out there, yeah, you guys were doing a good job. Any I awareness items for us or you have questions? I just bring your attention to uh, some things that have just been ongoing. I, I don't mention them, them, them very often. I want to make, uh, make attempts. I spoke with Mr. Zaharit, and, and uh, I don't care how much we say our hours is a little bit different than, than the Green Fire. It gives their briefs. Um, some of our things we have to keep close to our chest, so pending investigations and things that are going on. But in our continued efforts with our uh, U.S. 35 interdiction and those traveling through, um, just like to point out to you that, that our staff over the past uh, 30 days has made uh, two very significant traffic stops uh, that resulted in uh, um, a good amount of drugs that were taken, um, weapons involved as well, um, and things of that. So, so the, the efforts are out there, and um, it, it's still very uh, fruitful. We, we've made a dent. We know that we've made a dent through different intel, different um, task force intel here in Green County. In the past, uh, in the past years, we've had uh, the board has funded specific interdiction uh, programs, and so um, again, that uh, that offer is extended uh, to work with uh, your counterparts. And if it's deemed that uh, the board needs to fund a specific targeted uh, program, then please come back to us. Certainly, will, sir. It's on the radar. If you'd like to hear something, here, sir. Thank you. Any other questions for Sergeant Moore? We have no questions. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. HR. Thank you, Board. On page 30 of your packet is the bi-weekly report for HR, followed by the uh, uh, 
PwC stats on page 32. Uh, Trisha's on here to answer any questions. Trish, any awareness items for us as far as uh, things we need to watch out for or be aware of coming up? Well, our insurance says this. So I have um, done a proposal back so far. I'm just waiting for the health insurance to come back. And then we'll be scheduling meetings so that we can review that with the board. So I should have that by next week. I definitely have that. And what's our anniversary date for our? Um, well, we end um, the contract um, that we are under with Medical Mutual on June 30th. Okay. And this is the second year of the two-year um, agreement that we have? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. I have no other questions. Okay. Nothing additional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Board. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to Fire Marshal Grogan. So, first of all, thank you for hearing uh, Desmond's presentation. Again, um, um, Thanks to, to Max for bringing the, uh, the capstone students on board and presents a, a good resource for, for us in the township. And uh, again, we're definitely going to take uh, Desmond's findings and recommendations, as you said, into account. When we look at the comprehensive uh, land use plan in uh, June, July um, of 2020. Um, want to uh, ask that we withdraw the request for the uh, trustees hearing for the zoning case 821. Um, the zoning commission case Thursday night had a uh, split two, uh, two to two decision on a four member um, uh, commission, and um, they didn't. Uh, per our zoning uh, uh, zoning resolution, they did not take any further action. So we need to continue that meeting, and uh, we'll let you know a date and a time that that meeting will be continued. Then, so, but there were no further action. But uh, other than uh, um, uh, we had a. An enlightening start kickoff to the river cleanup, which uh, the weather has not uh, cooperated very well for the river rangers, but uh, um, they'll be they'll be working as soon as the river dies off a little bit. So, you have any questions on anything else? Let me... no. So uh, the zoning commission essentially will meet again to conclude to uh, essentially conclude their meeting. So yes, sir. Yeah, and, uh, and hopefully can have a. And if and if a fifth member would show up, they can have essentially you know, that fifth member can or cannot vote. Cannot, cannot okay. the so same four members that can vote again. Okay. Yep. Very good. Any, Any questions on the bi-weekly? <laughs> no, I have I have nothing. IT. Thank you. Thank you, board. Next item is on page 44 of your packet is the IT biweekly report. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, we are moving right along on um, the phase upgrade on the uh, server upgrade. So uh, phase one and two are both complete, and we're about 45% complete on phase three. So uh, we uh, did a major transfer to the new environment over the weekend. We did have some error messages, so they are working to mitigate those and start those up. Obviously, we're waiting till down, downtime because we do provide a 24-hour service between our substation and the sheriff's office and our fire department, plus the information that comes through us that goes to Beaver Creek Dispatch, Sugar Creek, Bellbrook as well. So we try to limit those uh, downtimes as well. Any questions? Roads. Thank you, board. Uh, first item is uh, on page 47 um, is a um, resolution to surplus items. Um, you can pass it as presented. Mr. Parks here to answer any questions. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, resolution of surplus equipment as presented. Second. Trustee Wallace. Yes. Trustee Dean. Yes. Trustee Putz. Yes. Thank you, Board. Uh, last item is the biweekly report for the road department. Although we didn't get any snow, Northern Ohio did. Uh, yes, <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. Saw that. Any questions for Mr. Parks? Have um, we? Have you received the equipment we just purchased from the county? And there, is it in play, working? Not currently. Still waiting on your new equipment to come in, and it should be by the end of 
Okay. I thought they weren't using that equipment, though. Yeah. Well, that's why we're running. Mother Nature's not been very kind to anybody. <laughs> so the grass was getting tall, so it had to be cut. So they're using their old equipment this time around, and I talked to their foreman, and uh, as of today, their new equipment's mounted on their new tractors, so it's open to receive at least one by the end of this week. Okay. Do we have any guarantees if something would happen to the equipment between now and the time we receive it? Do we have a, a guarantee or a policy in place that would tell us, you know, if, if they break it while they're using it? Since we've already looked at it and you observed it in the garage, now it's being used. So do we have a fallback method in case it's not perfect when you, I know it's older, I got that, but since they're using it and right. it's not currently, sitting in the garage anymore. Yeah, currently they have two. So if something would happen, we fall back to the second one. And in talking to their foreman, they will repair whatever before we receive it. All right, that's what I want to hear. Thank you. Mr. Parks, with the, all of the rain uh, that we've had, any uh, I know you've highlighted a few, you're checking on erosion control on several different of the projects, but um, any unresolved issues that we need to be aware of? Not at this time. The, uh, all the contractors are doing a fairly good job of uh, keeping them off the roadways. And so, and the erosion control, you know, like silt fence and those kind of things are in place. So. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Mr. Parks? I have none. I had none. Thank, Thank you. Fire. Thank you. Thank you. Chief. Good evening, board. First item we have for you tonight is a request for a proclamation uh, for EMS Week 2021. And board, there are two copies there. One for the proclama uh, one for the resolution book, and then one in the proclamation book. Do I need to read the whole thing? You can do it as present. As present. Make a motion to adopt proclamation number 2021 dash 8 on May 10th, uh, 2021, as presented for proclamation for emergency medical service professionals. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Walls? Yes. Trustee Kreitz? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, board. And with that, I'll extend an invitation next Wednesday and Friday evenings. We'll be having our annual open houses. Uh, they will be COVID compliant. Um, I don't know exactly how they'll be set up, but the crews are working through the details on that. Uh, they will follow the similar format to what we've been doing uh, recently, which is uh, neighborhood style. So 63 one evening, 64 the other evening. Uh, they'll be running from 6 to 8 o'clock those two evenings. Do you know which evening is uh, Yeah, I'm sorry. Station 63 will be on Wednesday the 19th and Station 64 Friday the 21st. Great. I'm sorry, if I have you? the right year on <laughs> I have the wrong year on my resolution the number, so I, hopefully I was looking at the right year on the eight. calendar. Six, six to eight each evening. Yes, sir. And what, when, which one is? Uh, 63, 63 is Wednesday, is Wednesday okay. and 64 is Friday. Okay. I don't know if they flip a coin or how they work that out, but that's what I was informed. Right. Uh, the community always enjoys this. Yes. Uh, it'll good. be good to see the kids again. So it's been a long time since we've had pitter patter of little feet in the station. So <laughs> I think we've got a whole bunch of plastic helmets waiting to go. <laughs> uh, the next item is our Station 65 update. And the uh, big news there is they are back on track for a uh, completion date of August 19th, which is the contractual completion date. So. They did make up the lost time and are moving forward. Uh, the bay floors were poured last Friday and look really good. So uh, we're very excited about that. And uh, we'll 
hopefully they'll be able to continue on as they've been doing. Helps to be under roof. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> Especially rain. with an inch of rain. <laughs> yes. Any other questions on 65? Uh, COVID, uh, the big news there is the Greene County pod has uh, finished. So um, our auxiliary was there through the end of it. Um, I'm in the pro I'm awaiting numbers from the county for the total number of inoculations and from the auxiliary for total volunteer hours. The volunteer hours were, I believe, over 3,500 hours since January, end of December, 1st of January, uh, which is a huge lift uh, from our organization to support that. Um, and I'll, again, I'll say, I don't think it would have gone nearly as well without them. They handled all of the people moving so the vaccinators and the staff there could focus on getting shots in arms. Um, and you can imagine moving people like that is uh, very complex, especially with the restrictions that COVID placed on it. So we also appreciate, we're gonna have a list of all of our partners, Russ Research, um, OU being the number one, obviously uh, giving the facility uh, to us for that period of time. Uh, AT&T FirstNet provided a lot of the um, uh, uh, data connections that we needed, um, and then a variety of uh, local um, uh, restaurants and uh, food purveyors uh, provided meals at re greatly reduced cost uh, or free for the volunteers during that time. So uh, it was, def was definitely a community effort to accomplish. And Chief, I'd like to make sure that you tell you the firefighter, I, I heard that a lot of firefighters on their off-duty time came in and worked days um, to help with that so please relay our our thanks for all the work our fire department did we thank the auxiliary a lot mm -hmm. and i thank them again but also our firefighters that took time off on their off time to to work yes ma'am and we're actually trying to get that so the the upside is our folks weren't looking for any sort of recognition so we don't know how many hours they put in we know there were a lot um, so we had some on duty, we had some off duty. We are trying to get that just so we can recognize them for it, uh, but it'll be up to them to tell us uh, because it was completely volunteer on their part. But yes, I will pass that Great along. Great job, though. Thank you. And uh, I guess the other part of COVID is just the regular service impact we've discussed and not much has changed there. We're maintaining our supplies um, and our operational processes just to make sure that we can uh, um, uh, meet our mission and the challenges of COVID and uh, we continue to do so. Any other questions regarding COVID? All right. And then the last I had for you is our uh, regular biweekly report. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Chief? I have no additional questions on the biweekly. I neither do I. Okay. That's it for today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Board. <laughs> Appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Board. That's all I have. Miss <clears throat> Frick. Uh, I don't have anything for you today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rushing. Thank you, Board. Uh, for your consideration, we do have one resolution to authorize additional appropriations for the COVID-19 relief fund. This is in regards to several purchase orders that were entered in at the end of the year in 2020. So they were encumbered, therefore they were not included in the available balance because they were already encumbered at year end. Uh, the activity has been taking place on those purchase orders and those purchase orders have been closed therefore any remaining balance to those purchase orders have, has been released back to fund balance and the same just needs to be reappropriated to the COVID-19 relief fund. Uh, so as the board knows the COVID-19 relief fund that is in regards to CARES Act funds that were passed by the federal government in 2020. We have until the end of this year to spend those. This is not in regards to the American Rescue Plan that the townships were left out of. So this um, resolution, um, you just need to be uh, passed as presented. Thank you. I'll make a motion for resolution number 202-10510-FIN-A, adopted today, May 10th, 2021, to authorize supplemental appropriations for Fund 2905 COVID-19 Relief Fund. Second. Trustee Walls? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. 
trustee thoughts. Yes. Thank you, board. That's all I have this evening. Uh, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission update. We had a meeting last week, last Thursday. Um, bylaws were um, changed and, and um, voted upon, and we asked for a third, 30% um, 30, 30 of the people on different committees would have to be present to make it a quorum. Uh, the track revised amendments were approved, um, and the uh, director stated how pleased he was with the township, Mr. Zaharieff and um, Green County engineer for the, for the presentation they were putting together for that evening, I believe it was, and that um, they were just couldn't believe how well the presentation was put together. So again, thanks staff for um, being recognized in a regional situation and, and how they were like, they wanted to use your presentation as a blueprint for future presentations to, to the track and ODOT. So high compliments Thank you. for our staff. And that's all I have. Great attack. No meeting. No meeting. Regional planning uh, executive uh, committee is next week. So I'll have a report after that. Health department. There was a meeting last Thursday. Um, Nothing really to report. They had uh, one of the Green County prosecutors come in and give their um, take on the House Bill 22 and what that um, impact that will be for the COVID and masks. And Thank you. Uh, school superintendent, city manager. Uh, no meetings since our last trustee meeting. Same thing with rights, right path. Okay. Green, Green County Township Association, we have a meeting tomorrow with the Green County Parks and Trails at 6.30. Dinner is included. Um, RSVP. And Investment Oversight Committee, um, nothing to report uh, at this time. So do we know when uh, he's scheduled for his next and Huntington is scheduled for their next uh, interim kind of update as far as cash flow projections or anything like that. Uh, I did send out the report and the packet, um, but if you want, uh, Mr. Sumner, we can do it on a quarterly basis. If we could just have them zoom in on that, maybe uh, end of June, first part of July. Sure. Yeah, we'll definitely. Just you know, that would be good. A mid year, so just a, a refresh. I read the report, but I'd, I'd rather have them present some things. Oh, absolutely. Just, yeah, from a projection standpoint. And a plus, change. the citizens maybe don't read the reports as well and I would rather sure. have it so that it's on a zoom so that people can hear about the investments anything else to come before the board this evening if not I'll look for a motion to adjourn so moved second trustee Dean yes trustee Wallace yes trustee Price. yes